There's always Vanilla and Jack's wife were seen by, you know, very few people. And I don't know what my fans uh, today will take from them. I mean, I, maybe they'll see a little bit of my style. Maybe they'll see a little bit of my head in there. There's always something instinctive. I mean, you can look at an artist's work, even if he changes styles over the years. There's, you know, you can always maybe see a little something there that connects you or says, oh yeah, I can recognize that. I can see the person in there. Uh, I don't know if, I don't know. Well, I haven't talked about There's Always Vanilla very much uh, because it wasn't really mine. It was written by a friend of mine, and, um, you know, we had a lot of problems. It was our second was the second film after Night of the Living Dead, and it, we all had our own different views about how which way it should go and how it should, what it should be. So it was not, you know, it wasn't really a fun experience that way. And... Um, but I loved working with the cast, and you know, it was it was a real learning experience. But you know, trying to do something that wasn't non-horror, and um, it, it it just was not. I don't think of it as a really complete film. Somehow, everybody's looking for the new thing. After Night of the Living Dead, I didn't want to make another horror film right away. I just didn't want to get typecast that way. Uh, you know, eventually it happened, and um, you know, and I, I love the genre, and I have no regrets about any of that. But I, at, uh, just initially, I didn't want to do it. We shot a little. It was basically it was a it was a uh, promo, a, a screen test film for Ray Lane, and that's really what There's Always Vanilla wound up being based on. We shot this little half-hour thing that Rudy Ritchie wrote, and um, um, it was you know its own entity, its own little film. And in some ways, I still think it's better. I wish I knew where that film was. In some ways, I think it's better than the resulting feature. Because it, was, it, it wasn't pretending to be something that it wasn't, you know. But um, we were influenced at, you know, at the time by films like Goodbye Columbus. And, you know, there were small independent movies that were coming out that were, you know, I guess you could call romantic comedies. I don't know how to categorize it even. Bittersweet little romance things. So we said, well, maybe we can do Night of the Living Dead again with a di in a different genre. And that's really what it was about. So uh, we asked Rudy to expand the, the script for this audition piece that we had done. And that's where the film came from. I still can't figure out why the whole thing happened. Everyone from Light and Image was involved in this film. I mean, our comp it was our you know, company project. We never were able, we didn't have the money or the time to do exactly what we wanted to do with it, and we wound up having to do all those narrations with Ray Lane to just sort of knit the thing together. And we spend a lot of time trying to solve old problems, and, and we don't get anywhere. So it was, you know, it was a little disappointing that way. We just weren't able to shoot everything that we wanted to shoot. It's Ray's movie. And Judy Ridley, for, her name was Ridley then, and was, you know, for, was in Night of the Living Dead. And I think the, the two of them carried the film. Ray was a very strong actor. I think he really could have had a career, a big career. But he chose to stay in Pittsburgh and teach and work at the Pittsburgh Playhouse and, you know, like that. Judy was very, you know, just brought a freshness to it. I mean, not, not an act, never trained as an actress at all. She just had a sort of instinct, a great look. And, and, you know, an instinctive ability to be natural and, you know, just not afraid of the camera. She was able to just relax and, you know, do her thing. We were producing TV commercials and industrial films at the time. We had the studio and the cameras and the lights and everything, so we set the film in that milieu. And Rudy's cousin, Richard, who plays the producer, Richard Ritchie, we call him the Rev. He's, he was around on many, many films all the way through Night Riders that we worked on. He actually was a, a TV commercial producer who had, went on and had a big career in New York and so forth, and then finally just got on a motorcycle and left the world, took off. You know, it was just our world. It was what we were doing then, and so we thought that was a good setting for this. We shot the film over months and months, and we, we would pick up the cameras and go and shoot a little bit and then shoot a little bit whenever we had time between jobs. And then we'd wait for Rudy to write, you know, some more, another scene or uh, some, get some more script pages from him. And so it was really spread out. It was kind of scattered. And I don't think any of us were very comfortable or happy with the way it turned out. So I don't think of it as um, 
uh, stylistically mine. I mean, I, I think that maybe what I had to do in the end was go back in and try to edit it and use the narration. And I used like these little stylistic tricks to try to make it all glue together and play. I don't think of uh, There's Always Vanilla as a film that I, that, that I directed as much as a film that I edited. I wasn't even at some of the screenings when we first brought it to look for distribution. And we finally uh, showed it to Canvas Films. They had been doing, you know, sort of softcore porn stuff. And they wanted to upgrade their image, and they, they picked it up as distributor. Called it The Affair. Um. It's an awful—I have to tell you, this is whether you put this on camera or not. It was an awful experience. I have very little recollection of what went on during the production of that film, and I care very little about it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. This is not just my mood. Season of the Witch, my original title for it was Jack's Wife. And um, I, I like it. I mean, it's the film of mine that I would really actually like to remake. Uh, because, again, we ran out of money. We didn't have enough, you know, we had, like, uh, an, an investment broker was going to raise, you know, 150. I forget what the budget was supposed to be. But they wound up, you know, raising 90,000 bucks and then bailed on us, and we never had the money to finish it. So it was really, a, a, it was real guerrilla filmmaking, and we tried to make that money stretch and and keep shooting and get it done. And again, it was all, you know, it was all because of the friends and sort of family and co-workers that we were able to um, get the film finished and even make it coherent. But I, I love it. I love the theme of it. I love the, and it might even be more pertinent today, you know, a woman who's just opening those doors and wanting to expand her horizons. Uh, there are still a lot of guys out there that just keep women locked in cages, in a, in a sense. I had ideas that I just wanted to execute. I mean, I was, you know, at the time, at the time we were, there were cities the, the size of Pittsburgh still had art cinemas that, you know, they were bringing in British films and Swedish films and French and Italian films. And so I think that maybe those uh, seeing um, Fellini and, you know, um, Renoir and uh, probably had an influence on stylistically on what I was, what I wanted to do with the film. Making film is, it's, a, it's a, at least for somebody like me who's a very sort of hands-on filmmaker, is just, it's a learning curve. It's, and I'm, you know, so you still learn. You, I'm still learning. But, you know, I've made 14, 15 flicks. John Ford, what do you make? A couple of hundred? You know, that's how you learn. You know, you learn, you just keep learning how to move the eye and how to do things. And this was very early film for me. I just had, I just had a knowledge of basic technique, but I was really still experimenting with style. And it's a very parasitic medium. I mean, I don't know that the opening dream sequence in this film, I don't know where I stole it from, but I'm sure I stole it from somebody. Hey, you know what I think? Oh, how in the hell could anybody have so many opinions without ever having done anything? The, the film and the character um, of Joan grew out of the time, I think. I mean, it just grew out of the late 60s, early 70s when it seemed as though, you know, women were wanting to, you know, break out. And this is not career stuff. It's not the, you know, the glass ceiling or anything like that. It was just, you know, the, you know a woman's role at home. And a woman is a less than complete citizen of the world, of a marriage, of a, of, of a relationship. And it just seemed like that was happening. And, you know, it seemed like there was a lot of that then. There was a lot in the press about it then. It was the beginning, you know, it was women's lit, the beginning of that, and the, all the sort of beginning rumblings of that. And I just thought it would be a good topic for uh, a film. And it's, it's, I wanted to, you know, sort of touch back on, on, you know, the horror roots using witchcraft, even though this is not a horror film. There are a couple of sort of, there are a couple of scary sequences that were those sequences that are supposed to be scary, but we didn't have the resources to really pull them off well. Um, you know, I mean, differences between this and, you know, and Rosemary's Baby are vast in terms of just execution. But um, thematically, you know, it's there. And I thought that that would help us in terms of, you know, uh, commercial success for the film. Of course, it didn't because this is the kind of film that needs a cast and needs uh, 
I mean a name cast in order to get good distribution. And I'm, but I'm very happy that it's there, and I, I really, um, it, it's gratifying that people actually really like this movie or see through past what I think are its technical failures and, you know, and get it. I think Jan was, was perfect. She portrayed that character really, really well. And she was, we met her through a commercial producer. She was an actress doing TV commercials, ads. And um, one of, a, a client of ours introduced us to her, and she just seemed perfect for it. Oh, holy Virago, we allow thee to depart and go to thy proper place. So mote it be. The theme of the, the witchcraft that runs through uh, Jack's wife uh, is not, it's not what the movie is about. It's her way of uh, cutting loose. And she's basically using it just as a way of saying, gee, I, I want to cut myself loose. I want to have an affair with this guy. I'll, I'll say the devil made me do it. And that's really what the theme of the movie is. I don't think the devil is actually there. I think that it's all in her head. There were a couple of odd things that happened, but you know, I'm not a believer in that kind of stuff, but more in the final line in the film when she says, I'm a witch. And when she said that, it's a crack opened in the ceiling right over her head. And it was, you know, I'm sure it was just the lights. We were on a real location, and I'm sure the lights were just too close to the ceiling. But it was pretty amazing. And you know, everybody was talking about, man, this is spooky stuff. Maybe the devil is, you know, on her shoulder somewhere. But I'm, I don't, I'm not a believer in anything like that. We just had a couple of those weird, wacky things happen. We needed a house that had a lot of doorways and things. And one of the guys that worked at Leighton Image, Gary Striner, knew the, the Forrest family and said, that house is pretty, is, uh, you know, might be right for you. So we went out and we looked at the house and uh, it was perfect. And they welcomed us into it. and. Um, um, they were, you know, I mean, it was, it was wonderful. I mean, they, they were really, they were, they, you know, they would cook meals for us. It wasn't like just renting a location. They enjoyed the whole process. And uh, Ingeborg Forrest was eventually met, said, well, you know, I have a daughter who's an actress living in New York. And I said, yeah, right. Maybe I'll give her a call someday. And it turned out that she's my wife now. Has been since 1980. I was a, sort of a Donovan fan, and I found that, uh, that song, Season of the Witch, and we decided to use it for that sequence. Again, I was looking for a way to, you know, just do a slightly more stylized sequence with the credit cards and buying the stuff. And, and uh, I. You know, I think it, it works pretty well. It's a, it's a pretty good sequence. Um, but I, I never intended to use the song and never, in call, never intended to call the movie Season of the Witch. I mean, in my mind, it was Jack's wife. Hungry wives. Yeah, it was turned over to a sales agent and who got a deal with Jack Harris. I wasn't part of the negotiations. I wasn't there. We had an agent representing us, and all I did was get the word that he wanted the movie to be shorter. I don't know if it even ever played in theaters. And then we, you know, quickly we went and did crazies, and things started to move a lot faster. After Night of the Living Dead, the disappointment of doing three films that sort of nobody saw was e immense. And the crazies at least opened uh, in theaters. It was at one of the early screenings of the crazies that I met Richard Rubenstein, and that's sort of when we started to do things, you know, professionally. In the case of uh, There's Always Vanilla and Jack's Wife, I, my strongest recollections of those films is just not having the money or the time to be able to really do what I wanted to do. And, um, you know, so you know, there's a big part of me that's almost written them off. I mean, in, you know, in terms of an, an emotional connection to them. The learning process and making those two films, it was so basic. I mean, it was really literally learning how to, you know, work the screw on the tripod and how to, you know, put a camera on a dolly. I think that has, I think Season of the Witch has the first dolly shot I ever did. I was just learning the most basic tools of the trade or how to use them or how to, you know, edit and the screen direct. I didn't even know about screen direction. I didn't even know that eyes should look at each other, you know. I'm not looking forward to watching them, no. I'm, and I probably will not watch them for a while, you know, maybe some time when I'm on vacation or whatever. I'll, I'll just, I'll, I don't know.
I'm, I'm not that way. I don't, I don't look at my own work or, you know, look at my old films uh, a lot. Uh, some, you know, you're forced to see them sometimes at conventions or at uh, events where people are showing them. But I, I, I generally don't. I'd rather, you know, so I'd, I'd rather look ahead and, you know, try to um, look forward to new stuff.